Yes, um, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm really thankful to organizers for setting such an interesting meeting up and for inviting me here. I also would like to join other speakers by saying happy birthday to Boris. We don't go with Boris as far as 26 years, uh, but a few years ago I came to um, ICTP for a conference, but I haven't met Boris at the conference or at ICTP or even in Trieste. I met him what seemed to me as the middle of nowhere in the mountains very close to Slovenian border by accident. And actually, I thought that Boris is just a random Russian tourist. So we got involved in some kind of meaning, meaningless conversation. He was from New York. I was in Los Angeles. So, you know, uh, the small talk. But when I left, I was accompanied by a member of ICTP staff. And he told me, look, the guy that we just met, he's very famous. I'm telling you, he's grand. I always see him with other very important people at ICTP, you know, being with them, shaking hands, etc., etc. And I even remember his name. His name is Arshavim. Obviously, the guy was very heavy on football. And my knowledge of football is rather rudimentary, but the name sounds familiar. So I said, oh, yeah, even I know that, Arshavin. Oh, yes, I think I've heard of that. And it took me another 10 minutes, like, Arshavin? Wait a second. So um, I think Leonid Levitov suggested that we make a gallery of our associations, of associations that the speakers have with Boris, you know, wise owl, uh, Shakespearean man, um, a Hollywood actor. So this is my contribution to the, to the gallery. <laughs> OK, I'm going to talk about polariton condensates um, and actually modeling for polariton condensates. And you have already heard some of the talks giving the basis of the physics of the polariton. So I will only mention shortly what I really need to have to in order to model. Uh, I will discuss shortly various modeling approach, mostly mean field. Um, I will discuss the proposal that we put forward of how the vortices can be observed and various stages of the transition from uh, integer vortices to uh, fractional vortices can be uh, observed by producing polariton lattices. And then I'll show how these, uh, these ideas were then implemented in experiment and what we learn. And then I'll go back and discuss the vortex lattices again. again. So in particular, I want to comment and discuss uh, how the uh, spots, the polariton spots, actually couple and what the phase results from this coupling. Uh, I will revise, therefore, with these new ideas, the previous experiments, and if the time allows, I will also talk about um, recent experiment uh, on spin reversal in a trapped condensate, in a condensate when the, when the condensate is created away from the pumping, pumping geometry. So the acknowledgments, the, um, the theory on spin reversal was done with my master's student at Skaltek, uh, Kirill Kalinin. Uh, Guido Franchetti, my PhD student and postdoc from Cambridge, who has now moved to Southampton. Magnus Born with a Fran Franchetti worked on um, some theory for the, to explain the experiment. Uh, we did modeling with my colleague Jonathan Keeling from St. Andrews University. And there is a very close collaboration with two experimental groups that use the samples produced in University of Crete by Pavla Savidis group. And so this is Nana Fatonian's group in Cambridge led by Jeremy Baumberg. The key people here were postdocs and student Gabriel Christman, Guel Tosi, Peter Cristofolini, and the experimental group of hybrid photonics in Southampton, led by Pavlos Lagudakis, and two people here, Hamido Hadzi and Alexis um, Askitopoulos. Um, Hamid actually started as a postdoc with Pavlos, then he was a postdoc with me funded by Skoltek, and now he's a postdoc with Jeremy. So as you can see, there is a lot of a lot of flux, uh, fluxes of uh, ideas between these, these groups. <coughs> OK, the idea behind polariton condensates is the absorption of photon by a semiconductor creates an exciton. Exciton emits photon. But if the Bragg mirror's reflectors are placed in resonance with the exciton, then the photon get, um, get reflected, reabsorbed, re-emitted. And that creates quantum mechanically the superposition of states called polariton. Polariton is half light, half matter. So it has the mass, the effective mass is four or five orders of magnitude lower than the mass of the electron. And since the BC 
temperature for the transition to BEC is inversely proportional to the mass, we expect that the temperature will be quite high in comparison with experiments on other BECs, like in ultra-cold atoms. The schematics of the experiment is a quantum well surrounded by uh, Bragg reflectors or another a uh, famous diagram is now compresses these layers, huge layers of into these two plates, just to show that the exciton and therefore polariton is a two-dimensional object. Um, in experiments that I'm going, there are different experiments of how the pumping um, is being done, how the particles are created. In the experiments I'm going to talk about, there is an incoherent source of particles. So the laser it is at a rather high energy creating the source of free carriers. These free carriers relax, emit phonon, scatter before they condense at the bottom of so-called lower polariton branch. The red reflectors are not perfect, uh, so after bouncing back and forth, the photons still escape, but this is the curse and the blessing because it is the, it has the con it continuation of the wave function of the condensate inside the cavity, and so by imaging these emitted photons, we can have all the information about the structure, about the density, energy of the, of the condensate. So what are the essential properties? This is an interacting system. In terms of the strength of the interaction, these systems lie between liquid helium and ultra-cold BCs. Uh, the short lifetime, as I mentioned, but now it even can be rather higher than 10 picoseconds in experiments by David Snoke in Pittsburgh by simply growing the number of Bragg reflectors, the lifetime has been increased to 100 picoseconds. That, that means that we're dealing with essentially non-equilibrium condensate um, that also has, uh, from the light, it inherits the polarization state, so we will talk about left and right circular polarized states. But the coupling between mechanical strain, the interfaces of the crystal, um, actually leads to unusual experimental break symmetry and still favors the particular linear polarization. So two components for the left and right circular states actually coupled together. But, there are some, but the magnetic field, for instance, can change that. So our first uh, attempt at modeling uh, the system simply came from uh, starting with equilibrium condensate, the usual gross pitayevsky equation, uh, with two rather phenomenological terms, or three, uh, this is just the constant, uh, that represent the pumping. So this is the usual Laplacian, if we just take the low momentum into consideration, the uh, repulsion due to the self-interaction, some external potential that could include, include also the repulsion with the non-condensed particles. So there is the pumping. All the detail of the pump is included in this, in this general term. There is the lifetime in the cavity of the polaritons. And in some cases, we would also use this inelastic scattering that leads to cubic nonlinearity, cubic decay. And then the details uh, of the different models really just vary of how much information we write into the pumping. For the very simple model, we can say that the pumping is just a constant, and then we, of course, need this cubic nonlinearity to have the gain separation, uh, to, uh, gain saturation, sorry. Uh, we can add the term, which is uh, like a landau kalatnikov term for the, for the superfluids that represent the energy redistribution between polariton particles and non-condensed <laughs> particles. Or it could be uh, made more detailed by writing the rate equation for the reservoir of non-condensed particles. It has the, its own decay rate. It has scattering to and from the reservoir into the condensate particles. There is a pump and they, uh, there is even diffusion, but it's been estimated that the diffusion of the reservoir cloud is rather small, so this term typically is neglected. So and this has come from the model first introduced by Wouters and Carusotto uh, based on generic laser, laser model. Um, so now we can have several regimes, really, if emission follows the bare photon dispersion, we refer to it as a regular lasing. If emission follows the lower polariton branch, this is polariton condensation. As I mentioned, by changing the number of Bragg reflectors, the system can be made 
more at the equilibrium or less at the equilibrium. So um, actually, we should have some unified approach to, discuss, to describe the transition from uh, normal lasers, very non-equilibrium system, all the way to um, equilibrium Bose-Einstein condensate. And we actually have um, you know, had some ideas of how to do that. So if one starts with the Maxwell and, and did it, uh, if one starts with Maxwell block equation for a laser, um, uh, which can be reduced to complex swift Honenberg equation. And from this, we actually can recover the complex Ginzburg lambda. It's rather uh, rather standard standard scheme for deriving the complex Ginzburg lambda in this context. So it could be adapted to polariton systems. So there is, it's not just fully a uh, phenological model. It has some justification. Actually, uh, it's been surprisingly accurate in modeling uh, these condensates, even more surprising because it's still rather phenological model. Um, we c I will talk about hydrodynamics. Uh, so I will just write this model, I'll drop all the, all the dimensions and use the simplest form where there is a linear pump and nonlinear decay uh, to illustrate the formation, uh, to illustrate the existence of vortices here. So the usual Madelung transformation for the amplitude and the velocity reduces to the usual mass continuity and the integrated form of the Bernoulli equation, which is almost classic, except for this so-called quantum pressure term. Since the system is described by the, by the wave function, um, the quantized vortices naturally exist, because as you go around any closed contour, the phase can only change by a multiple of 2 pi, and therefore there have to be a point inside the contour where the phase is 0, uh, where, sorry, where amplitude is 0 to compensate the phase singularity. And then from these equations, we again recover the usual equations, uh, the oil equation for the inviscid, inviscid flow. Um, from this simple model, we can actually get, I will talk about the pump geometry, so I will need to have some idea about the uh, chemical potential, density, distribution, and velocity. I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail in uh, each time I mention some solutions, but the idea is quite simple, that uh, if we look for the steady state, and what I will mostly uh, look for, we drop the time-dependent terms, instead introducing, therefore, the chemical potential, and from, if from the symmetry of the system, we can find the velocity at a particular point, then from the first equation, we know what the density is going to be. From the second equation, we know, we know what the chemical potential, therefore, for the entire system is going to be. And therefore, we have then two equations to solve for density and velocity for a given chemical potential. And this is usually done by some perturbation expansion with some asymptotic matching uh, between different regimes of the solution. Okay, so the vortices were observed. In particular, fractional vortices have been observed in, a, in the group of Konstantinos Lagoudakis in Grenoble, where a different material, so the, the experiments that I'm going to talk about use gallium arsenide. It's rather regular material. You know, there's imperfection are quite small. Pavla Savidis in Crete does really very excellent job in producing these accurate samples. But the first experiments were done in cadmium telluride that has very disordered potential. But what was noticed is that then the vortices during the condensate formation um, become pinned to the minima of the density and the, uh, to the minimum of the, of the density of this uh, disordered potential. And they can be visualized. And for instance, this is exactly the same position on the sample. But now this is for uh, left and right circularly polarized states separately. And there is a vortex in one component, but not in another. And actually, all different configuration of integer vortices and fractional vortices have been, uh, have been found in this simple uh, sample of cadmium telluride. So it's been established that the vortices, such vortices exist. And uh, so then we looked at the modeling for the spin degree of freedom of these condensates, again, starting with the usual Hamiltonian for two component Bose gas. Um, from experiments, it's known that t there is a tendency to bioexiton formation that gives a weakly attractive interaction between two different components, about 10% of the repulsive interaction of the self-interaction self within each component. I will also, to, make, to distinguish between or to, um, to, um, uh, to distinguish between the two components, we can apply the magnetic field that this is just the Zeeman splitting that favors one polarization over, over another. 
but, is, but uh, in the usual crystal, the symmetry, the circular symmetry is broken. So there are two equivalent axes, and that brings about this term into the equation. But on the interfaces between, between these, um, these, uh, these cr uh, crystals or in the presence of the mechanical stress, actually this term will dominate that brings about um, the coupling between left and right so that now two components actually see the phases of each other through this kind of uh, Josephson, Josephson coupling. So this is the model again dropping, the simplest model dropping all the, all the dimensions. And now we have the interplay, therefore, between the, uh, between the magnetic field, the effect of the magnetic field, and the Josephson coupling between the components. So we can understand how the system behaves by moving to two mode systems, so neglecting all the spatial variations and writing the system in terms of the average density and the half of the, dis the difference between two densities. And that reduces the global phase, doesn't show up in the equation. So we have the system of three ordinary differential equations to solve. And for the Josephson regime, when j is sufficiently smaller than this coefficient, which is about 1 of the order 1, 1.1, 1 .1, and the half of the density, then we can actually reduce, drop these terms, solve the last equation for the average density, and reduce, therefore, the system to the equation for a driven damp pendulum. Once we have driven damp pendulum, we know how the system behaves. First of all, there is a region of where we have fixed point for the relative phase. There is a region where there is a limit cycle. And then for some values, for some relationship between these parameters, we can have also the region of bistability. Uh, Arnold Stump. We don't have to just deal with this equation. This is just the idea. But if we solve the full, uh, full uh, system of three equations, we, we recover the full bifurcation diagram, which is drawn again for the effect of the Josephson coupling um, uh, magnetic field. And if, for instance, I now, now J is set by the structure itself, so it's a constant. So as I start increasing the magnetic field, it's fixed point, fixed point, fixed point, and then somewhere on this branch, either through this part of this saddle node bifurcation or hole bifurcation, we go into the limit cycle. If the magnetic field is decreased, then it's limit cycle, limit cycle, limit cycle, and then through the Hamakling bifurcation, we get to the, to the fixed point. So this all gave us idea how to actually um, observe and modify the vortices in, this, um, in the system. So our proposal was to start pumping condensate, polariton condensate, in the corners of equilateral triangle. So if we create polaritons in these three corners, each is created incoherently, so they don't share the global phase. But then we thought as soon as the polariton condensate is created, there are exchange of fluxes. So each condensate now acts resonantly on another condensate, so these all will be locked in phase. I will show you then why we were actually um, overlooked one particular ingredient of the system. So, but that was the idea. So they all lock in phase, and then we have a simple superposition of wave functions. Uh, even the linear sum of the wave function will produce the, the lattice of vortices. So this is alternating current plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus one, minus one, plus one, etc. So this is how the vortex lattice is created. There is no, you know, nothing interesting about that. But then as the magnetic field is applied, initially we have the lattice of integer vortices, but as the magnetic field is applied, we still have the, the there is a decrease of the density of one component, but still the integer lattice survives until there is this transition to the limit cycle, to the desynchronized regime, at which point only the lattice of the majority component survives. And the second component has no vortices anymore. It's just some oscillating state that averages to a non-vortex solution. So that was our proposal. Actually, it's never been published. It's in the archive because um, it came back from PRL referees, and all referees said, you know, we don't believe that this can be done experimentally. So your proposal is flawed, you know, you're theorists, you know, we don't, don't think it can actually be done. But I took this proposal to Jeremy, and actually within the days, you know, they produced um, the vortex lattice, 
The only correction that our proposal was to pump like 10 microns, and Jeremy laughed at it, but one micron radius of the pump was sufficient, and indeed this, this lattice has been generated, again showing this plus minus plus minus alternating vortices. But before, so, um, and then the idea came, okay, let's take a look at one spot, let's take a look at two spots and see what, what is there. So this is the experiment on just one spot, actually showing that there is some blue shift. So the condensate is being formed on this hill as the, as the ring actually condensate. So this hill that you can see in black is actually the reservoir. So this is the reservoir of non-condensed polaritons, and then this, the condensate is, um, is a ring around the top. And on this wave vector plot, it's also clear that actually there is expansion of this condensate that away from the pumping spot has the constant velocity, constant outpropagating velocity. And we had some. So actually, this problem can be solved exactly, as I said, with um, asymptotic expansion. And we actually did it um, to recover the full, um, the full structure of the density and velocity, depending on the system parameters. But what I need to have for uh, what is to come is just a simple estimate of the chemical potential. So therefore, I'll just take these two equations. So again, I wrote it in uh, continuity and Bernoulli. And then if I have a large pumping spot, then at the center of this pumping spot, the velocity is almost zero, and the gradient of the velocity is almost zero. So this expression in parentheses should become zero, and therefore at the center of the spot, we know approximately <coughs> what the density is, therefore we know what is the chemical potential is. And then we can see, go back to the equation and find, to this equation and find, therefore the velocity away from the pump should be given by square root of mu times the mass of the polariton. Uh, and that's, that's therefore gives us this expression for this wave, wave vector in terms of the system, system parameters. OK, what about two spots? Well, let me move to the two spots, because that, caused some, uh, that posed quite a few actually questions, quite surprisingly. So this is experiment, again, from, uh, um, from the Cambridge experiment when, again, there is a beam splitter that creates two condensates distance 20 microns apart, and the pump for each, um, the width of the pump is about one micron. And what has been, so then the, there are two reservoirs, these two heels created at the place where the pump is, the two pumps are located. And as you can see in this direction, these two heels create what looks almost like the harmonic potential. And indeed, when energy is resolved along this distance, the state of what looks like the quantum, quantum oscillator, quantum pendulum, were obtained. So we have this ground state, the first excited state, the next excited state, and all these <laughs> levels are equidistant. There is an equal um, energy spacing between them. And this is just the resolution of this, um, of this uh, line, but now in two dimensions, showing again the ground state, the first excited state, etc. Another interesting thing was actually in this inset, because it, which shows that as the distance between the pumping spot increases, the distance between energy level decreases, and as we increase twice the distance between the spots, the distance between the energy level decreases by a factor of two. So how to explain that? We explain that uh, by, again, using the model and observing what we call the oscillation of the dark soliton between the peaks. So I will explain what is shown. So now this is theory. This is numerical simulation. Again, I take the line between two pumping spots and then resolve energy versus the distance, again, obtaining something that looks very much like experimental data. But if the, in experiment all the states are average, here I can resolve in time and then see what happens. So again, against this line, but now I put it with 90 degrees. And now you can see the black soliton just jumping between two maxima, providing, providing this pattern. As we increase the energy of the pump, we could also observe the turbulent excitations of this dark soliton. 
Of course, when I say dark soliton, it's not a dark, it's not dark and it's not soliton because we are not dealing with one dimensional system, it's two dimensional system. The governing equation is a complex Ginzburg Landau. So what is here is really more, more uh, likely to, to be called traveling hole solution as the solution of the Ginzburg Landau. So it's a localized disturbance that appears and reappears. But its action is to actually move the system through these, through these um, energy le levels. To understand analytically what is going on, I will look at slightly simplified problem. In this problem, it's one-dimensional problem. There is a constant pump, but to represent the reservoir, it's a double Gaussian. Why a double Gaussian? So there is a minimum and there is a maximum because then everything can be solved analytically in terms of the error function and we can actually observe the formation of the traveling hole. So this gives the velocity profile for various height of the Gaussian. And then there is a criticality at which, so now I show the density, the travel hole is created. You see the sudden drop in the density, so this is now only up to this criticality, we have an analytical solution, and then this traveling hole develops at the particular maximum of the velocity, and this 1D simulation in time, just showing the peak, how the peak is created, it decays, and then the new one reappears, it drifts away, disappears, etc. So this is a simple, simple model that actually captures this essential phenomena that as we increase the pumping intensity, the velocity reaches the criticality and it creates the traveling hole. And the, uh, in, uh, in a similar configuration, it's also possible to create, to create a vortex anti-vortex pair and then the, the, the minimum part of the double Gaussian can be served as to actually trap this, uh, this vortex pair as a stationary solution. But it's, it's a slightly different story. Okay, uh, so uh, then the Southampton group, they have done more also uh, another set of experiments, but this time they just slightly above the threshold. And then they observe that as they move, if they change the distance between two pumping spots, then they can have either destructive interference in between or constructive or destructive. So they actually observe the single level. Instead of this graduation of levels, there is just a single energy state. It's a stationary state, unlike the Cambridge experiment. And then in Cambridge, we did the same thing, just, just be above the threshold and indeed confirm so that we have a single, single energy level. And that depending this time on the pumping intensity, again, we have the even or odd number of these blobs in this energy profile. As, and as the intensity of the pump is growing, then we recover this harmonic oscillator. And the highest intensity, the more levels we're going to have. So uh, what is going on? So why, the first question was posed in this, in, this, in this paper was, so why do we have the stationary states? Because the destructive interference between two spots implies that these two condensates are not locked in phase. They look with a pi different phase. So how to explain to explain that? And now, so this was done again in this manuscript by Southampton, and I think Yuri Rubo was responsible for a very nice idea that what system is trying to do is trying to maximize the number of particles. So if you're just above the threshold, it means that the first you're going to lays into the state that has the maximum number of particles, total particles in the system. And so, and then a simple mass, so if we take the sum of the two um, order parameters with the relative phase different theta, and so now I use my analytical estimate for, for psi and evaluate this integral, then we recover uh, the function which is positive for density, depends on the relative position of the pumping spots and their densities, and then there is this Bessel function that depends on uh, the distance times this parameter that depends on the chemical potential multiplied by the cosine of the difference of the phases. Therefore, if the distance is such that for a given chemical potential the Bessel function is positive, then two components lock in the phase, so with phase difference zero, there is a constructive interference in between, but if 
this Bessel function is negative, then they lock in with the pi phase difference. And this is explained now the energy spacing in Cambridge experiments, and it explains why we see these levels. Because for the high, although we are uh, quite above the threshold, but again, the system goes into the state depending on the chemical potential that correspond to the state. So if we call the difference between the energy levels delta mu, then we use this criterion, criterion to find out what, um, how mu and A are linked together, expand and tailor for the small energy distance. And again, and we see that uh, indeed the energy spacing multiplied by the distance should be constant. So if distance goes by a factor of two, the energy spacing decreases by a factor of two. So now I think we have the complete picture of what's going on. And just to complete off what else have been done on two spots, so we looked at the, some discrepancy between spots, and it turns out that the system can be phase-locked, but uh, only if this uh, difference in pumping is sufficiently small. Otherwise, we simply have two different, different chemical potentials for two different condensates, and therefore, uh, during the averaging experiment, everything averages out to zero. We don't see any... Mm. So each condensate just acts according to its, um, to its chemical potential. And there are also these um, uh, recent pulsed excitation when the time evolution of the cloud has been time resolved. And you can see either the propagation of the dark soliton or bright soliton depending on the intensity of the pumping spot. Again, it makes... Um, uh, it, we understand why it happens, because again, depending on intensity, the Bessel function for the given distance between pulsings, uh, between uh, polaritons is either positive or negative. So either we have constructive, interfe destructive interference in the middle or constructive, and then as the time goes on, that's ex indeed what, what evolution of what we, what we observe. Okay, so it all uh, comes together. So let me go back to this uh, three pumping, uh, pump geometry with the three pumps. Um, in Jeremy and Cambridge experiment, we didn't see any other configuration, just all condensate would always be in phase. Um, but with four components, oops, sorry, but with four components, there were two possibilities. Either all four components are in phase or there is a pi difference between the nearest neighbors. And again, if they're all in phase, then there is a constructive interference in the middle. If they are not in phase, then it's destructive. We vary the pumping spot and actually indeed observe uh, these two configurations. Mm. And now again, once we, we know the criterion, how the uh, condensates uh, lock in the phase, and indeed, this corresponds to the situation when the, pump, the relationship between pumping and the distance between spot gives the negative Bessel function, and therefore um, they lock with pi, pi difference to, to maximize the number of particles in the system. Uh, in uh, Southampton group, they redid this experiment for three pumping spots and observed that, again, there, it's possible to have, in this case, 2 pi over 3 difference, so that there is a winding as one goes around these three spots. Again, this corresponds to the case when this criterion gives the negative Bessel function, so the number of particles is maximized when there is uh, winding around, the, around these latest, latest points, and numerical, numerical simulation confirmed that. Okay, there was some other work done on uh, even more than... Um, two, three, or four condensates. Um, so this is, for instance, six condensates, etc. So it's an infinite game. But what is interesting here is that as one... So previously I talked about the situation when you condense where you pump. But it turns out that as the distance between the pump get close, so if the distance becomes small, then instead of condensing where the pump is, the, the polariton condenses in the middle. And it's especially uh, clearly seen on this, on this, perhaps on this picture, when there are six uh, pumping spots, but the condensate is in the middle, or here where the pump is in the ring, but the condensate is in the middle. Okay. So 
Unlike, so these were referred to as the lattice condensates and these were trapped condensates. So there is a very sharp transition. And we had some theoretical also explanation why it happens. But what I would like to uh, mention, so that my last, last topic, uh, to go back to the, spinner tra uh, to the spinner degree of freedom. And there are these two recent experiments, again, in Southampton and Cambridge. In Southampton, where the condensate is created on the ring, the ring has small radius, so actually uh, the trapped state is in the middle. <coughs> and in, the Cambr in Cambridge, uh, the geometry was uh, in four um, corners of the square, uh, again with the condensate in the middle. In both cases, um, Hamito Hadi was doing experiment. Uh, so that's why uh, geometry perhaps is different, but the idea is quite similar. And what, what was observed, and now the, there is this discrepancy between these two experiments, that they resolved, in both cases, the degree of circular polarization. And in Southampton, when they recorded, according to, so the, there is this, um, uh, the increase in the pumping, and this is the uh, discrepancy between polarization, the degree of circular polarization. So at the threshold, although they pump with almost the same intensity, almost linearly, there is about 60-80% of the condensate in one component in another. And then as the power increases, the pumping power increases, it levers off until it becomes linearly, but then it drops. So there is a spin reversal. It means that we pump with, say, predominantly left component, but in this regime, we have predominantly the right component. In Cambridge experiment, they've seen the same rise to 60-80%. And then the leveling off, but they've never observed the spin, uh, spin, spin flip. So we did a theoretical uh, investigation, and we decided that it's really due to this discrepancy in the initial pumping, pumping profile. So we pump with slightly more of one than another, and this due to a very narrow focusing of the pumping beam that actually makes this quite, quite dramatically different. And that difference creates a kind of a Zeeman effect that now it prefers one polarization over another. And the two polarizations are coupled with this Josephson, Josephson coupling. And again, we'll write explicitly the rate equation. So when we go back to two model model, then for the relative, you can only write the equation for the relative phase. And you can see that if the uh, z here, uh, it, it left on the previous slide, z is the half difference between the densities of two components. So if we have an about linear polarization, z is quite small, then both of these terms, and I'm pumping predominantly plus in comparison with the minus, then both of these terms would be negative unless z changes its sign. z changes its sign, it means that at this point I would have to have spin flip, and as in the case with, um, with, um, uh, with Arnold's tongue that I described before, we have the region where there is a fixed point, when there is desynchronization, so this is just the average over the oscillations, and then fixed point again. And so and this is the comparison of the experimental data and what our model gives us for moderate discrepancy between the pumping into the right and left, so about 10% more, is created uh, in right circular polarized light than in the left. And as you can see, qualitatively, we're about the same. So there is a rise to 80%, and then there is a graduation, and then at about twice 2.2 of the threshold, we have the spin flip, and then it goes back to uh, linear polarization. And now you can ask, but why didn't we see, uh, why didn't they see it in Cambridge experiment? And um, I would say that as we vary the discrepancy, this point, the point of transition, moves further. So which suggests that simply they pump and the discrepancy of their lenses are in a regime that the discrepancy that which we, with which they feed the, their condensate is higher, and therefore this transition would be observed uh, at much higher pumping powers that they didn't, uh, didn't really reach. Okay, so... Um, in the conclusion, uh, what are the interesting things that can come out of this?
So I talked to you about modeling of polariton condensates. Um, I think I gave you some idea of how phenological complex Ginsburg-Landau equation works. Actually, uh, it works, as I said, surprisingly well. Uh, we need more experimental data, and that's what we're working on now, just again going back even to a single pump and actually tune the parameters and really understand you know, which regime and change the regime to see how robust the model really is. Uh, we also need to be more careful in modeling interaction and the non-condensed cloud itself uh, and also un uh, understand how spin dynamics work. We also continue working on the pumped condensate lattices and especially we're interested in frustrated systems. There are the questions concerning vortices and turbulent flow. We also predicted and analyzed a little bit how the turbulent flow uh, appears, but more work needed on this front. Uh, there is a lot of discussion on what is really nonlinear and linear effects in these systems. So, there were, you know, that's another topic of discussion. And finally, we think of, uh, we put some proposals on applications for sensors, uh, for quantum circuits. And that's, so I thank you. I think I should stop here. The chairman is already standing. <laughs> so, thank you.